Hey everybody, welcome back. I have another video for you. Been a little while since I recorded, so let's jump right into it. If you're seeing a free video on YouTube or elsewhere, please go over to the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. I have lots more content, videos, writing, other things over there. That's of course, uh, some of it's free to the public, some of it's only for the subscribers. Those of you subscribing, supporting this work, I really appreciate it. As always, I try to remind people that when we say independent analysis we actually mean independent analysis not these people who call themselves independent and hew to the kremlin's line or to the nato line or to whatever it is independent means independent in thought and it also means financially independent it means not being on anybody's payroll so those of you uh you know 150 or so people who are over on the patreon supporting the work Thank you so much. All right. I want to talk about a few different stories here, some of them kind of bouncing around different aspects of what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on globally. So let's jump right into that. I want to talk first about an interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal that is in some senses... Um, sort of recapitulating some of the things I've talked about here, but it's been several months. So let's review the question of how Russia and Russia's actions are being seen in the global South. I did a whole video on this. I don't remember when that was. Maybe that was April or May or June, or maybe it was later. It's all blurred together at this point, but I have done videos about this, but it is worth talking about now as we are here at the very beginning of November. So the, the piece was in the Wall Street Journal written by a journalist named Yaroslav Trofimov, uh, headline, Why Many in the Developing World Have Sided with Russia. So talking through some of these ideas here, it's, it, some of it is very obvious, right, that countries that have a, a, their own history of colonization, of being oppressed and subjugated by a colonial power, um, those countries in theory, should naturally be aligning with Ukraine, defending Ukraine, the country that has been invaded by its larger neighbor, its larger neighbor that is the former imperial power in the region, its, its larger neighbor that is historically the uh, oppressor. Now, the issue is that uh, many of those countries in the global south, especially in Africa, have not automatically sided with Ukraine. And I think it's worth considering some of the reasons why and considering which of those countries really have not done so. Um, now, when I say aligning with Ukraine, I'm trying to use sort of plain speech here. Obviously, there's a diplomatic kabuki theater that goes on here between, you know, formally uh, backing Russia versus abstaining versus kind of speaking out of both sides of your mouth kind of sort of trying to walk a line between the West and Russia. You get my point that there are countries that are operating in shades of gray here, but ultimately those that have refused to outright condemn Russia, that's what we're actually talking about. Those who have provided to some, to varying degrees, diplomatic cover. Um, now, 19 of the 35 abstentions in the most recent UN vote condemning Russia's annexation of four uh, Ukrainian oblasts, um, 19 of the 35 abstentions were from Africa. And I guess the three that we could probably most specifically uh, highlight those that are highlighted in the Wall Street Journal article that I referenced, uh, the link to which I'll include in the notes here. Uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, and Algeria, all three countries historically very important for understanding the post-colonial period in Africa. Um, just to very quickly talk through, uh, obviously, Algeria, which is one of the famous uh, revolutionary struggles in Africa, the struggle against French colonial occupation, uh, the Battle of Algeria. Algiers, famously one of the great films of all time. Um, Ethiopia, with its own anti colonial struggle, both in terms of the uh, invasion by the Italian fascists, but also in the long and very complicated history of Ethiopia during the Cold War um, and, you know, the relations with the Soviet Union. In South Africa, with its own history of colonization and apartheid, and um, again, these are countries that theoretically you would think would have some affinity for Ukraine, but they 
don't. And it is interesting. And I don't want to only focus on Africa. I don't want to say they don't have an affinity for Ukraine, but rather they're not openly condemning Russia. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think privately might be a different story. Um, India and Pakistan, historic rivals, both of which have refused to um, either condemn or openly support what Russia has been doing. So despite the rivalry, both countries have more or less taken the same position, which is interesting considering the, uh, you know, the elephant in the room in that equation being China. Of course, China's close relationship with Russia would naturally dictate that Pakistan, its close, close ally of decades, would naturally fall in line with the Chinese. But India, with its longstanding rivalry uh, with China, India is an interesting case. India has these historic ties with well, what's, what was the Soviet Union, but India also has a lot of uh, middlemen who are making tremendous profits off of this highly discounted Russian oil, Russian weapons, and other things that are flowing into India. So lots of money to be made for Indian capitalists, and I think that's part of the reason why Modi and Modi's government has been so uh, careful not to alienate Russia in this growing conflict. Vietnam, Cuba, two uh, traditional Soviet allies that have continued having uh, relatively close economic relations with Russia. Both of them, for their own reasons, have refused to uh, condemn, openly condemn Russia. And uh, I think also of note, former Soviet republics, um, at least some of which I've talked about here before, they fall into a very interesting position where they are economically dependent or to some degree economically dependent upon Russia, especially with regard to the migrant labor force and the remittances coming back to those countries. But at the same time, they also have that very complicated colonial and post-colonial sort of legacy with Russia, with Russian chauvinism the from the imperial period and through the Soviet period. So again, we have very complicated um, relations here that I think all need to be taken into account. But I bring all of it up to point out that there are some general ideas that we should be aware of and, and, and how they fit in to all of this. Because again, we're not condemning or supporting what these countries are doing. We're trying to understand why they see things the way they see things, at least from a public standpoint. The first is the obvious. That is the hypocrisy of the United States and the West. It is obvious on its face. The United States is an imperial monster. NATO is its military arm. People in Africa, for example, have seen this on display uh, even recently in the last 10 years. The NATO war on Libya is a perfect example of an egregious war crime carried out by NATO against a nation that did not attack any NATO countries. The Africans uh, around the continent saw all that. They were obviously powerless to stop it. Um, and I think it, to a large degree, tarnished whatever standing the United States and NATO may have had up until that point. And of course, uh, that's not the only example. That's one specific to Africa. We could, of course, point to a European example of NATO's criminality in, in the bombing of Serbia. For instance, the, um, the ongoing conflicts that NATO was sort of instrument the the instrumentalized military force for obviously Afghanistan and elsewhere so NATO's reputation has been tarnished. The West is seen as warmongering and hypocritical. And when I say the West, I don't just mean that as a euphemism for the United States. I include, of course, the British, the French, the other European powers who have their own complicated and, and, and very ugly uh, colonial legacies in Africa and elsewhere in the global South. So again, there is this obvious hypocrisy. This is... Um, Unfortunately for Ukraine, this taints Ukraine in the global public consciousness because Ukraine is then associated with the United States, NATO, and the West. And this is where the conversation about proxy war really begins to come in. Ukraine has no agency. Ukrainians who are fighting to defend their homes and their communities and their country, they're nothing but pawns of the United States, you see. And to a global public, this makes perfect sense because they've seen that story repeated countless times before 
before where the United States has instrumentalized all kinds of conflicts for its own ends. And so this complicates the picture for Ukraine. There's no doubt about that. It is one of the major difficulties that Ukraine has internationally in being able to really uh, propagate its own narrative to counter Russia's propaganda edifice. Um, The second issue here is practical, and that is that there are plenty of countries in Africa and elsewhere in the global south that have very clear motivations, pragmatic motivations for wanting to stay on Russia's good side. And it's not just because of whatever economic relations there may be. Again, Russia's economy is minuscule in comparison to some other uh, global heavyweights. I mean, their economy is roughly equivalent to Spain or some of these other mid-tier European countries, certainly not an economy of the scale of a global power. And yet Russia's outsized political and military power sort of is used to compensate for that. Anyway, Russia offers quite a bit to countries in the global south. Look at what the Russian uh, Wagner mercenaries and other uh, operators are doing in places like Mali, where they provide protection for a military junta that is control in, in control of the government after having ejected France. Again, well, let's just talk about that for a second. Mali is a perfect example of where this is extremely complicated and extremely awkward for the Ukrainian side here. Russia, despite all of the criminality, despite the multiple um, uh, <laughs> multiple war crimes that Russia's Wagner Nazi mercenaries have carried out in Mali, Russia still represents in the minds of many a force for good because they defend the government that ejected the French, the longtime colonial master, and even up until recently, the uh, military occupier via the Operation Barkhan and the French military presence in the Sahel. So even in a place like Mali, which is in the grand scheme of things, a fairly minor country in, in, you know, in the Sahel region, but in the context of Mali, we see how Russia represents a practical need for certain countries in Africa and in the global South. In Mali, in Sudan, they provide protection for a military junta that's trying to fight off a democracy movement. Um, we see this in, in Libya, where Wagner mercenaries have been operating for several years now throughout the Russian push to try to install Haftar in the leadership in that country. Uh, so we have a number of examples where just from a uh, security perspective, the Russians present an alternative. If you want to in any way uh, um, challenge whatever existing forces may be in the country from the United States, from France, from Britain, etc., you better have the Russians on your side. At least that is the thinking of some elements in Africa and elsewhere. Um, I think, and also, of course, there is, you know, practical need for military equipment, for potentially scientific, technical advisory uh, assistance, whatever that might be. Um, And then third, and this is also important, is that to a large extent around the world, there's a very real lack of understanding about the nature of this conflict, about the facts, about what's actually going on, about who did what, when, about the timeline, about what happened in 2014, about the reality of Donetsk and Lugansk, about all of these questions that the Russians have really poured a lot of effort into muddying, into making difficult to ascertain the reality. Frankly, a lot of these countries in Africa haven't really figured out what's what. And, um, you know, I suppose, I suppose that's a failing on their part in one sense, but on the other hand, I suppose that's also, uh, you know, to be expected. Ukraine is not exactly at the top of the list of, uh, worries for a lot of these countries, but falling on the bad side of Russia might be at the top of one of those lists. Okay. So, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, member of parliament in Ukraine named Jean Belenyuk. He is a, he is the first black uh, Minister of Parliament. Um, he's the one in, in Ukraine. He's the one doing outreach in Africa, trying to highlight the parallels between Ukraine and some of these countries that suffered under colonialism and through the post-colonial period. Now, obviously, there is a there is a clear difference, right? And I don't have to explain all of the various differences, the white supremacy inherent in European attitudes towards Ukrainians versus European attitudes towards, say, Libyans or, uh, you know, Ethiopians or Cameroonians or what have you from Africa. There's that 
the racial component to it. But of course, there's much more to it than that. Ukraine is seen as part of the sort of US NATO system. And as such, it doesn't elicit the same kind of sympathy, at least from a lot of these quarters. And I'm, I, I know I'm sort of restating what I've already said, but I think this is important. Um, as I mentioned already, Pakistan, Pakistan's non-committal on this issue is very, very interesting. Countries, frankly, don't want to get involved in having to be forced to picking a side in what they see as sort of a new Cold War that has emerged. And I know that it's popular now to talk about this as a new Cold War. I sort of think that's somewhat reductive. I, I think it's much more complicated than that. I don't really think this is a Cold War so much as this is a global capitalist crisis and uh, sort of Im imperial and sub-imperial rivalries and all sorts of other things that are happening. But anyway, when the issue is framed in the global South, it is not framed as Russia versus Ukraine. The Russians and their propaganda and, 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 and others who are also not part of the Russian propaganda, they do frame the conflict as one that is essentially between NATO and Russia. And this is very important for the Russians. This is actually critical for their entire global propaganda effort. When the conflict is shifted from Russia versus Ukraine to NATO versus Russia, Russia goes from being the bully aggressor to being the underdog, the weak party, the party that is aggrieved, the party that is on the defensive. In other words, it takes a criminal uh, act like the war crime that is the entire war in Ukraine, and it turns it into an act of defense. And this is, of course, the entire argument that the Russians have really been using. Forget denazification, desatanification, all of the other insanity that comes out of the day-to-day -day grind of Russian propaganda. Ultimately, when you distill it down, especially for those of us on the left, the one underlying argument that makes any sense at all is seeing the Ukraine conflict as one between Russia and NATO. And that's exactly how Putin wants it framed, because when it is framed that way, Russia gets the sympathy globally, at least within the quarters of the global South that we're talking about here. That is, I would say, the primary reason why Russia's propaganda is so effective uh, in the global South. Um, you know, and the other aspect of this, too, is that Russia has successfully managed to avoid the label of colonial power. Right. And part of that is because the Russians part of it is because the Russians never had their own African colonies or colonies in what we call the global south today. Uh, Russia's colonies were more within the Eurasian space. Of course, all of the Central Asian former Soviet republics, you know, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and all of this. But, you know, all of the colonized peoples within the Russian Federation, in the Caucasus, in the Far East, elsewhere, indigenous groups, others, all of those were part of the sort of the what what in the 19th century was called the prison house of nations as lenin of course appropriated that term to great effect um so russia is obviously a colonial power but it was never a colonial power in those parts of the global south where the british and the french and the dutch and the germans and you know uh later the united states where they were colonial power so in a sense at least in the public imagination russia avoids that label and that's obviously to its great benefit. And there is, of course, a paradox here that has to be pointed out. It's not a paradox. It's an obvious hypocrisy that has to be addressed. And it's important that we address this. Let's talk about Putin's September 30th speech. Very interesting. I'm just going to pick out one quote, the quote that's highlighted in the Wall Street Journal article. I think it's the most relevant quote from Putin. The West is ready to cross all lines to maintain the neo-colonial system that allows it to remain a parasite to rob the world thanks to the power of the dollar and the diktat of its technology and to extract a tribute from humanity, basing its unearned prosperity on the hegemon's rent, end quote. Boy, who could disagree? That has tremendous resonance globally. It's almost, I mean, it almost sounds, you know, uh, like it could have come from, you know, some revolutionary voice, and yet it comes from Putin. And gee, isn't it clear that Putin is representative of a, of a push against, uh, you know, the West, etc.? I'm sorry, did he say the West is maintaining a neo-colonial system? I believe he did. He said this in his September 30th speech. 
which is the speech that he used to announce the annexation of four Ukrainian oblasts. Do you understand what I'm pointing out here, folks? I'm trying to highlight the fact that this is absurd hypocrisy on its face, and yet the hypocrisy doesn't matter. It still lands in places in the global south. They don't care that Putin is trying to posture as an anti-colonial voice at the very same moment that he is using neo-colonial annexation of a former colonial possession. That hypocrisy doesn't matter. It still lands. And that is what has the United States and the West and Ukraine so worried, is that the Russians have successfully uh, um, you know, propagated these narratives, partially because they're rooted in some degree of truth, as all great propaganda is, and partially because the West is so morally and politically bankrupt in so many corners of the world for the most obvious of reasons. Um, so a- anyway, this resonates, it, it lands, and also... Uh, we we should point out to the uh, the legacy of Soviet uh, support for anti-colonial struggles, especially in Africa. Uh, obviously, even at the time, it was rooted in uh, the Soviet, you know, self-interest, self, you know, motivations that they had for propagating, um, you know, their ideology versus that of the United States. I don't have to explain that the nature of the Cold War. The point is the Soviets supported many of the states that ultimately became the modern states of Africa. And that, uh, you know, collective memory is not totally forgotten, even though, of course, Russia of today is nothing like the Soviet Union back then. Um, There is no actual anti-capitalist ideology. There is no understanding of anti-imperialism as we think of it. There is only anti-American sentiment, which is, of course, understandable. All right. I don't want to dwell on that too much. There's so much more to cover. Um, let me let me talk a little bit about this uh, UN Office of uh, uh, the High Commissioner on Human Rights report. Um, I am not going to dwell on it. It is horrendous. I recommend you read the report itself. I will link to that as well. But very quickly, in March of 2022, so just within weeks of the uh, formal invasion by the Russians, the Human Rights Council established an independent international commission of inquiry to investigate human rights abuses that were going on in Ukraine in conjunction with, well, what was at the time the the very recent invasion. This um, International Commission of Inquiry includes three independent members uh, from Norway, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Colombia. I don't know if their names matter. Eric Mos, Yasminka Jumur, and Pablo de Grief. Anyway, whatever. That's where they're from. Um, they traveled to Ukraine five times uh, over over a course of four weeks, five weeks, and uh, they went to 27 cities, towns, and settlements. They conducted 191 interviews, 110 of which were with women, 81 with men. They focused on four regions, that is the regions of Kiev, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, and Sumy. And this is from late February to March of 2022. So to be clear, Everything contained in this report was took place only within a period of five weeks. So we can imagine in the nine months since then, how many of these type of incidents have occurred. Again, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of imagination to multiply in your mind by some sick exponent to understand the, the, the scale of what's happening here. Everything in this report happened within basically one month, the first month of the war, and only in four regions of the country. Okay, so very, very limited in scope. So um, I'm not going to recount all of them. I'm not going, it would require trigger warnings and all the rest of it. I'm not going to get into all of it. Just understand rape sexual violence across the board from ra- uh, ranging from ages four year, as young as four years old to as old as 80 years old, having been raped, tortured, forced to participate in just the most unspeakable uh, crimes. Um, I'm not going to, you know what, I even wrote down some of the examples here, but I just can't read it out because it makes me upset. Um, four-year-olds just just 
just the most awful kinds of things you can imagine. Okay, so why do I bring it up? I don't have much else to say about it. You've got to go read the report yourself. But frankly, these type of reports get lost. They get lost in the shuffle of the daily news cycle. People forget. People miss it. It's just another thing happening. Just the war in Ukraine. It's just it's happening over there. And we've got to worry about it because, you know, mushroom clouds and, you know, the end of the world and all of these things, right? And all of these ideas going through your head and fears and worries about famine, about this, about that. And then you have to ground yourself again and remember what's happening on the ground every day to the people who have to open their front door and see those soldiers standing there, kicking in the door, taking their daughter, their sister, whatever it is, right? I'm not going to paint the whole picture for you. Remember what it means to humanize this conflict. Don't get purely caught up in the politics and the geopolitics and forget these are real people. OK, anyway, um, that report is it's tough reading, but it is worth reading, because, again, as I have already mentioned, when you then take that very small snapshot and begin to generalize it more broadly in your mind, I think you can again remind yourself of the horror of war and of this unspeakable war crime that is being committed here. OK, um, I want to talk about another uh, article that I don't remember what the outlet was. Um, I think it was called the Caravel or something to that effect. Or is that an ice cream place? I don't know. Uh, no easy EU access for Russian draft dodgers. Interesting uh, little article here. And I want to walk you through my own emotional response to it because I think, well, maybe it's instructive or maybe maybe not. Um, so the EU Home Affairs Commissioner, a woman named Ilva Johansson, said that Russians should not be given Schengen visas, which are short term, to essentially tourist visas to travel all throughout the, uh, the European Union. OK, now, when I first heard the news about this, my initial thought was how utterly stupid that the Europeans are trying to make it more difficult, not less difficult, more difficult for Russians to leave Russia and to enter into Europe. How self-defeating and utterly ludicrous that seemed, right? If Europe's intention is to, you know, weaken Russia's ability to continue prosecuting the war and hopefully force the Russians to some kind of a negotiation and end to this war, obviously you would want as many people flooding out of Russia as you can. So how utterly stupid. Right. But then if you actually read it a little bit more and you think about it a little more carefully, as I had to force myself to do, I actually came around to the opposite conclusion here. My emotional reaction was to say that's stupid and it's a violation of the rights of those Russians who are essentially refusing service. Right. But that's not actually what's happening here. And that's not what's being suggested. In fact, it is codified within the European Union's own charter that political asylum is available to those Russians who are fleeing mobilization. In other words, if you are fleeing the, you know, being, being conscripted into the Russian army, you can absolutely enter into the European Union under the rules of an asylum seeker. What they're saying here is that they should not be allowing Russians to essentially act as tourists in Europe while they wait for the mobilization to blow over. In other words, you can't just be a, you know, a, a war supporter with a Z sticker on your lapel and on your car or whatever. And then when mobilization comes, be like, yeah, I'm going to go to Greece for a little while and then I'll come back when things blow over. No. Right. This is the difference here. In other words, Russians who are fleeing the draft can still flee the draft. Latvia, in fact, which is virulently anti-Russian in many ways, Latvia has already codified into law that they are offering asylum to Russians who can prove by actually showing the documents with their name on it that they were mobilized and that they are fleeing the draft. So I had to take a step back and actually reevaluate it because I, it wasn't what I thought it was. In other words, I thought they were trying to prevent Russians from coming into Europe. They're not. They're trying to prevent affluent Russians who maybe they're supportive of the war, maybe not, are basically going to use their money to go to Europe on an extended holiday while the whole war blows over. Right. That is 
what's at issue here. Now, people could disagree with that. You could say, sure, rich Russians should be able to do whatever the hell they want. They didn't start the war. Well, that may be. But does Europe have to offer that kind of a playground to the wealthy elites of Moscow who want to send their children to, you know, go continue living their best life on Instagram in the West or whatever? That is what this is actually about. Um, so anyway, I thought that was worth pointing out anyway. Um, I'm at 30 minutes and I want to focus on one more article that I think is really critical here. Probably should do a whole video on this um, itself. Maybe I will actually, but um, I want to talk about um, what what Putin has announced recently, this has kind of flown under the radar of a lot of people, but Putin has basically reorganized the entire Russian government and the entire Russian state to a large degree, just overnight, essentially by decree. So um, on, um, on uh, was it September 30th, during the, during the speech, Putin announced uh, martial law in the four annexed regions, again, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk and Lugansk, but he also, at the same time, he gave special powers to the regional governors within the Russian Federation. And this basically means that they can do whatever the hell they want in order to keep the regions under control, including fundamental uh, uh, restriction of things like uh, civil liberties. Um, this is a restructuring of the Russian government. This is the creation of what is now, let's see, uh, a new Russian governmental body. Did I write down the formal name for it? It is a coordination council. Okay. And the regional government, actually, let me get to the coordination council in a second. The regional governors can now limit civil liberties. The federal government now has more ability to move the economy to war footing. And the different regions will now have different powers depending on the regions and the examples that are given in the article. It's a great article uh, that I, I will link to as well. Uh, Crimea, for example, allowing for temporary resettlement of residents. Gee, I wonder uh, what what historical echoes that brings up, lest we forget Stalin's forced deportation of the Tatars of Crimea, uh, you know, to Central Asia, Uzbekistan, I believe. Um, so Crimea is allowing for temporary resettlement. Moscow authorities can now limit the movement of vehicles. They can do things like tell people where they can and can't go, when they can and can't drive, etc. Infrastructure defenses have now been reinforced. I think this is probably a no-brainer given the amount of sabotage that the Russians have seen. Um, so what this is really telling us, I think, is that a major shift, a well, recognition and shift has happened within Russia. Putin clearly feels he was let down, let down by his defense ministry, let down by the security services. So what he is now doing is he is shifting the authority for the day-to-day -day prosecution of this war, uh, not the military prosecution in terms of battle planning, but in terms of actually providing the logistics, the supplies, the material, making the decisions that matter in terms of economic output relative to the war. All of these things that are being taken out of the hands of the defense ministry, out of the hands of the war planners, and put into the hands of the civilian bureaucracy. Um, essentially, specifically, this new coordination council, which is headed by the prime minister, Mistushin. Uh, they, this was announced in uh, the middle of October. They had their first meeting last week, the end of October. And uh, what is this? What does this mean? Well, Putin has directed the council to transform the entire economy. And the transformation of the economy is designed to sustain the war long term. As I have said for so long now, this war was not going to be a short war the minute the Russians failed in a blitzkrieg, right? Or, you know, to use the Nazi term. I mean, you know, the, the, the attempt to quickly take Kiev and quickly implement regime change, that was clearly off the table within a matter of a, few, of a couple weeks. And I think at that point it became clear, as I've been saying since then, that this was going to be a long war. So, uh, you know settle in for a long and painful conflict. And Putin, I think, is is recognizing that and tacitly admitting that they have failed up until now. If they hadn't failed, they wouldn't take the authority away from the defense ministry. They wouldn't take the authority away from the intelligence services, the security services, and put it in the hands of this coordination council. What are they going to be tasked with? Army supply targets. So that means 
providing all of the equipment. We've all seen the videos of Russian soldiers freezing, you know, out, you know, sleeping in the mud, sleeping in, you know, under equipped uh, barracks and so forth, talking about, you know, having to provide their own body armor, their own extra socks, their own, you know, everything, right? This was, at least from the perspective of the Kremlin, this was an example of the kind of mismanagement that Putin won't accept. That is one of the things that this new coordination council is going to be responsible for, controlling prices, suppliers, logistics, all of that is going to be within their purview, building and equipping military facilities, barracks, other types of facilities. Um, the council decisions are binding. Okay, This is a supra-governmental body, right? They're binding for government officials, just as they're binding for private businesses, right? This is, again, this is basically, it's bigger than the Russian government. It's, it's, it's more government. It's, it's, well, it's a supra government. Um, manufacturing businesses specifically are going to be essentially requisitioned for the war effort. So Putin basically now has a council that supersedes the government. Right. And this is basically what he said. He quote in his quote from um, the what was this? October 15th, 16th. Quote, the time has come to update Russia's system of government. Simple, plain, update the form of government, make it more vertical, more directly answerable to Putin, less independent authority in, you know, various ways. This is a de facto admission that the defense ministry failed, that the security services have failed, that the military has basically lost the war. In other words, he no longer has confidence in military planners, in, mil in, in, in their ability to handle logistics, etc. So the military has failed. The deputy defense minister was fired. Uh, and now all military supplying to be done by civilians the prime minister and others. Who's on the council? Prime Minister Mistushin, Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin, again, another close Putin uh, figure, uh, the deputy prime minister, the senior economic managers. Interestingly, not uh, Nabulina, the head of the central bank, who is probably the one figure in Russia who is still respected internationally. She is uh, in many ways seen as something of a rational voice, a voice of reason in Russia, despite her, you know, refusal to, uh, you know, break with Putin as she was under a lot of pressure to do. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to point out here at the very end. I'm pushing 40 minutes, which is well past the time. Um, clearly, Putin is nervous about internal polling, internal polling after the Ukrainian counteroffensive, and especially after the mobilization showed support dragging significantly. Now, it has picked up somewhat since then. I'm talking about support for, you know, the special military operation. Uh, it has picked up somewhat since then, which is obviously a good sign for Putin. I think that just means that Russia's propaganda is doing its thing, massaging public opinion, doing what it needs to do. At the same time, he's nervous. He's nervous, especially about the 18 to 45 age demographic, which for the entirety of this war has obviously lagged significantly behind the older age bracket in terms of support for the war. One point that I want to make here is that uh, throughout this conflict and, and even before, uh, Russia has tried obviously absurdly, but tried to paint the war in Ukraine as a parallel to World War II or the Great Patriotic War, which is at this point now, essentially, aside from Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, it is basically the state religion in Russia, worship of World War II, the Great Patriotic War, etc. And um, throughout the conflict, this has been sort of the framing that Russian propaganda has used. And similarly, they're using that now with regard to this council. They're comparing it to uh, Stalin's State Defense Committee, which was a very similar type of uh, super governmental body that basically Stalin composed for the entirety of the 1941-1945 period that made most of the decisions about, you know, military logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So 
trying again to frame the war in Ukraine in the terms that are most acceptable to Russians, which is glorification of the great patriotic war. It's obviously laughable on its face. This is nothing like the war against Nazi Germany. This is very much like the Russians acting like Nazi Germany, but that's for another day. We will leave it there. Again, go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. If you want these, this kind of analysis, insights on what's going on with this war that's not filtered through the Kremlin's bullshit or through Washington's bullshit, go to the Patreon, support the work. Appreciate it. Talk to you all again next time.